We have, so your presenters today are Craig Isaacs from Unified Compliance and myself, Graham Ford with 501 Comments. Um, Craig, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm CEO of Unified Compliance. We have the world's largest compliance database. It's publicly available. You can actually go check it out. And I'm really pleased to be supporting uh, 501 Commons efforts and um, supporting nonprofits. Great. Thanks, Craig. And um, I, my name is Graham, and I'm the I Director of Technology Consulting and Services here at 501 Commons. Um, for those of you not familiar with 501 Commons, we're a capacity building nonprofit that provides services to other nonprofits to help them um, expand and better meet their mission. So we, um, in large part, we, we provide technology services, HR, finance, and management consulting um, at either free or reduced rates um, to nonprofits. So this work today is, um, has come out of um, a, the last sort of year of us thinking a little bit deeper into compliance and security and how we can help nonprofits um, in, you know, move along the maturity um, path to um, increase their capacity and better protect um, themselves and their constituents. And um, at some point, we were um, looking at tools for managing compliance, and we were introduced to Craig, who um, has become a great partner for us in helping bring their their um, uh, the Com Common Controls Hub um, to nonprofits and make it more accessible. So that's a little bit of background. Um, so why comply? And, and Oh, and by the way, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in, and we will be answering those in a Q&A session um, towards the end of the, um, the presentation. Also, we don't anticipate this will take all hour and a half. We look forward to giving you back um, a little bit of your day. Um, so please be patient. We don't think this will be a full 90-minute um, webinar. So why comply? You know, it's not just about legal requirements. You know, we have uh, we work with a lot of nonprofits that have sort of strings attached by their funders, say um, government institutions like um, state um, state uh, department, like Department of DSHS of Washington State, will um, require its grantees or organizations that it's funding to meet certain standards. Also. You know, nonprofits have a duty to those that it works with, that, that give it money, its donors, to protect their information, their credit information, or even their names and identities. Um, a duty to constituents, often, even if, an, um, let's take, for example, a um, homeless shelter or domestic violence organization. They may have private information that is important to um, protect even if there is no specific legal requirement, that organization would suffer significant damage. And frankly, it's significantly aligned with its mission to protect the identities and protect those um, the, the people that they are um, intending to serve. Now, that isn't to say that those organizations don't understand that requirement, but, that, but compliance plays into that process in helping them understand and ensure that they're meeting the um, a certain level of standard by which they protect those constituents. Also, there's a duty to staff. Um, most nonprofits pay their employees, and so they'll have information that is um, such as social security numbers or other um, pr information about staff that um, needs to be protected. And you know, state privacy laws and such can you know govern those rules. So uh, compliance helps you tell a story, and you know, beyond the legal requirements helps you set a standard and be able to speak to those constituents, whether it be they donors, um, uh, uh, participants in programs, or staff, about what the organization is doing and why to protect the, the information. And so all of this feeds into the mission of the organization. So this is why we believe it's so important for nonprofits to be thinking about compliance beyond the simple legal requirements they may fall under. So let's talk a little about the threat landscape and um, the things we think about when we're uh, looking at compliance um, and the, the drivers behind it. 
because if in, in a perfect world where there's no one, no threats, there's no everything, everyone is doing everything perfectly, why would you need to do this? So we need to think about the threat landscape. It also lets us um, define the types of concerns that we're trying to address as we're working through compliance. So the first one, which is probably, um, in fact, is the least likely, is external target, you know, targeted threats. So some people may call this advanced, um, advanced targeted threats. Um, so these are nearly impossible to stop. This is that attacker that has significant resources and is intent to penetrate your organization. For most organizations, um, this is not an issue, you know, or at least it is highly unlikely. And the cost benefit of trying to of going to significant extents to prevent this are very um, uh, don't make sense. So. We tend not to think about targeted threats as, you know, the um, <clears throat> something that we are making significant investments towards protecting against. Um, now, we don't want to leave the door open to those um, to attackers to walk in. We want to make it more difficult, but this isn't our highest priority. Um, next, there are sort of the external broad threats. These are the things your organizations are dealing with every day. And this is very, very common. You know, um, 501 Commons provides IT services to a number of nonprofits, and we see this all the time. Um, you know, and it's something that is just, it's increasing um, daily, the uh, number of um, attacks and such things that are happening against all nonprofits. There's ransomware. This is the software that will encrypt all the files in your, your server or your desktops and then make you pay Bitcoin to, um, release the software, there's this general spyware, um, phishing attacks to get passwords to bank accounts, and then there's other thieves. So um, that can be people that want to break into your computer to run special programs to um, use your computing power of your server or things like that. We've, we've seen it all. Um, and these are, that, I think, the external broad threats are happening every day. The other areas of compliance that I think are not often thought about because we think about external threats are, in, you know, internal bad actors, disgruntled staff, general laziness, you know, someone who just doesn't follow, the, you know, staff that maybe don't always follow the processes um, correctly, and, you know, personal grudges. Now, we don't, you know, ideally in all of our organizations, we have perfect staff who are all, you know, mission driven and, you know, in it for the organization. But, you know, as leaders in an organization, you also need to protect yourself. And so good compliance and good processes can help you walk the line between sort of um, trusting your staff and believing your staff and protecting yourself against issues. It means that when you have to um, engage in an HR action with an employee, you don't have to start doing things special for that employee because you've got strong practices in place um, already. Uh, the next step is accidents. Accidents happen. Someone deletes a folder off a server. They, um, you know, accidentally uh, send an email in a CC the wrong person. Strong practices can um, help make accidents um, reduce the impact. So whether it's having good backup systems or protecting access to information, it'll keep someone an accident from, say, disclosing sensitive information or deleting the most critical information. So this is where accidents play in this. Next is just general system failures, whether it's due to bugs in software that it might expose um, information or mechanical failure of hard drives on servers. Um, Compliance in terms of protecting your information and the business continuity um, play in here. And system, so system failures are, in some ways, a threat to your organization, and they happen. And so that's, um, you know. So now in the compliance standards, you know, many organizations will know or have to, you know, when they have to comply with HIPAA, FERPA, FISMA, or some other compliance rule. And if you don't, and you're dealing with health information or um, you have students that you're working with, I, you know, you should talk to your lawyer to understand, you know, what it is, the information that you have. 
and what what would govern the protection of those. Um, other, you know, often organizations are frequently going through PCI compliance scans and um, audits because they're processing credit card information um, for, you know, information for donors. Now, what if you don't have a legal obligation? You're not, um, you know, providing mental health care. You are not a private school. Um, you don't deal with federal government, so you don't have FISMA. Um, PCI you might have, but it's not maybe enough because they're really only looking at credit card information to a large extent. Well, there's standards bodies to the rescue because compliance can go beyond simply those legal standards. It can mean saying, we are gonna choose a standard that our organization is going to follow so that when our board asks us, what are we doing to protect our constituents and our data? Because a board member, you know, frankly, we're all reading the news right now. We're all, you know, seeing, um, what's happening in you know around the world in terms of security, whether it's you know the Democratic Party, the French you know elections, um, Sony uh, you know getting movie you know Netflix getting movies released, all of those things, um, you know often uh, executive directors are being asked by their board what they're doing. So to solve this problem, there are various standards bodies. There's NIST, SANS. Um, and types of organizations that have general standards. One standard that we kind of like is the top 20 controls or the critical controls from the SANS Institute. So the, the design of those controls is to try to take sort of an 80-20 approach. We want to, you know, solving um, where we want to solve sort of 80% of the solution, you know, gets us most of the way there and has a satisfactory solution for most organizations. So the standard bodies design, you know, level, you know, uh, maintain these controls and these standards um, that any organization can comply with and they will help you um, protect your organization and your information. And you don't have to necessarily go to the extents of HIPAA, FERPA, or FISMA because um, and frankly, that wouldn't be appropriate in many cases. You want or, um, to protect your entire organization, and you, that's where they, these come into play. So what's next? I, we're going to jump in, and I'm going to pass the presenter to Craig. Um, so one of the things that you know is important is, and I'll just go back here, um, some organizations, maybe they do have to comply with HIPAA, but HIPAA may not be all-inclusive. They also say want to be able to um, find another standard to um, comply with. And how do you track all of the information um, and all the controls in these, these documents? They're complicated. They also are non-overlapping. It is, it's not trivial to just sit down and, you know, check off a list of all of these. Also, these documents and standards get updated over time. The standard this year may change next year as the body that governs the standard changes the standard. So in order to solve this problem, um, 501 Commons started looking around to look at organizations that will help with that. And this is where we got introduced to Craig and Unified Compliance and where they come in, um, can provide some great tools to help solve this problem for organizations, including nonprofits. So that's a little introduction. I wanna, now I'm going to change. Um, hand it over to Craig, who can then um, uh, talk a little bit more about Unified Compliance and the Common Controls Hub. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Appreciate that introduction. Uh, hopefully my screen's showing. Uh, so, Unified Compliance Framework, what are we actually trying to solve? What problems are we trying to solve? And I think Graham laid out a lot of the issues. Um, and when we talk to organizations, nonprofit or governmental or anyone really, this is what we're hearing. People are overloaded with audits. They're trying to do compliance by spreadsheets and following multiple standards. And it's really difficult to figure out the right things to do. And sometimes organizations say, you know, I just want to first protect my systems and, and then figure out where the gaps are for what I'm supposed to be doing legally so that I can then at least move towards providing what I need to provide legally for my organization. So um, that's really kind of the focus of what we're trying to help with. What a lot of folks do is leverage a standard. And I think Graham referenced that he likes, you know, the top 20 security controls, which by the way is 249 separate controls. Um, 
but it's <laughs> it's nice to be able to say top 20 because it's like 20 paragraphs, right? And each paragraph has about 10 controls in it. But one of the, the common solutions, like I said, is to leverage a standard. And there are a lot of great reasons to leverage standards because other organizations are doing it. You might be familiar with it. Um, you can go to events um, for the organization. But there are some issues uh, um, with leveraging a standard because sometimes just blindly following the standard and thinking that's going to get you covered um, will get you in trouble because there are huge misses. And if you think about the actual legal requirements versus standards requirements, there's no way any standard can meet every legal requirement. It's just, there's just too much. And so I'm going to take um, an example with ISO 27001, but it could be the same thing with NIST 853 or the top 20 you know, critical controls. And I'm just going to kind of bounce through these things. And the idea here is it's a Venn diagram. And if you look on the right-hand side, it's going to be whatever the, the vertical is. In this case, it's banking. Um, and the left-hand side is ISO 27001. And so here, there's 132 overlapping controls. But there are 58 things you might be doing for ISO 27001 that don't even apply to the, your legal requirements versus 894 other specific requirements that would be legally required for banks or financial institutions. Same thing with healthcare. So if you're trying to do HIPAA, and this goes with everything. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each slide, but if you get the idea, if you need to do PCI, ISO 27001 is not the way to get PCI um, because there's so much left outside. Same thing with North American privacy. But what's great about leveraging something like any standard is if you find the overlap, you can find ways to have common language about how you're going to accomplish those pieces and then work on you know, the other controls that are mandated. And then Sarbanes-Oxley, which you don't have to deal with at all. Um, but actually, so maybe some of you do, because if you're getting primary funding from organizations that are covered under SOX, that might be part of their supply chain requirements. So um, the real solution is to leverage a common control framework. So you can see how those requirements, right, how the standards connect to your actual legal requirements. And so let me just kind of go through what a common control framework is. And then we'll talk about the unified compliance framework, which is a common control framework. So the idea for a common control is that it's a shared compliance requirement that's written in plain language that lawyers and technologists and anybody could really understand what they're trying to say, right? But the key is it's connected to the original mandate. So when you look at the common control, you can say, okay, why is this here? Oh, it's here because of PCI and NIST 853. Got it. Okay. So what a lot of folks do in terms of connecting controls, they'll do crosswalking of citations and they'll use the baseline as that you know, standard they want to connect to. But what happens is they'll connect things that don't necessarily connect, right? So you might have a control that's more broad or you know, general versus something very specific. And you'll, people try to connect those because they don't want to change the original framework. And with a common control framework, you don't have that issue because the common controls are created if there's a mandate that calls for that. And so you think of it like a superset, right? So it's a superset of everything ever connected to the framework. Because if there's something new, you say, oh, this is new. Synchronize the clocks on your log servers. That's something that nobody specifically asked for. Um, so let's add that as a new control. Uh, another one was um, include wireless networking, your, your wireless network equipment in your technology inventory. Well, PCI added that because of Target, right? Target lost a lot of data because their wireless access points were broken into, um, and a lot of customer data, millions of dollars were lost. And so we had to add a new control that said specifically include your networking equipment in your inventory. What about the framework itself? So I mentioned synchronize the clocks on your log server, right? Well, that is legally a child of establishing and maintaining log servers, right? You, you can't actually have log servers that function unless the clocks are synchronized because you'll have a bunch of logs all over the place that don't connect. And so if you have multiple log servers, you have to synchronize the clocks. Now, very few things say, very few mandates actually include synchronize the clocks on your log servers, but you know you have to do it, right? And so that's why when we look at the common control framework, it has to be in a legal hierarchy. And that way, you can actually connect all these different types of authority documents. If you look at PCI, it's very, very specific. And you look at the top 20 controls, they're mostly pretty general. And this cybersecurity framework, even more general. 
All right, uh, if you look at specific configuration requirements from like DSA stigs, very, very specific, very low level. So the only way to connect all these things together is to maintain this legal hierarchy. It's like clasping your hands together, interlacing your fingers. Some things are higher level, some things are lower level, but it's okay. They fit together and you have to understand how they fit together so you can implement your solutions appropriately. The other cool thing is if you keep a common control framework as your base, well, when things change, you don't have to change very much because you have a baseline set of controls. And you know, even, even when we get something wildly crazy like um, GDPR from Europe, which is the G general data privacy, it's, it's crazy document um, where there are a bunch of new controls, you still have your baseline set of controls. And you add this new thing and say, okay, well, there are 30 new controls. Let's put them in. Um, but you can see where they fit. And finally, you can do a common control audit. So rather than saying, okay, well, now we've got to go do PCI, and now we've got to do HIPAA, and now we've got to do this, and having your folks answer the same questions over and over again, you can audit once and attest multiple times. So for the UCF, we actually have three primary components. We have the Common Controls Hub, the UCF Mapper, and UCF itself. And so let's talk about the framework first. When we think about a framework or a database, right, it's a, it's a database. Um, it has content and structure and methodology for putting the contents in the structure. So let's talk about the content. We cover information security. That's why Graham's here. <laughs> That's why this is about technology. So it's all about technology and physical protection, system continuity, records management. I don't need to read the whole slide, but you get that. We're focused on these areas. We, um, we're not doing green building standards, lead standards, or things like, like that. This is all about information security and how to protect all the data around it. And we will look at the structure this is actually key, and the reason why I'm showing you this is because when I get to the demo part, um, it will look like voodoo magic um, without understanding how we basically work and how the database works. And when we get an authority document, you can see we have, these are, they look like elements, right? Because we discovered the only way this makes sense, the only way to connect these things so you can automate huge chunks of this. And while we're gonna take the first step with, um, you know, Graham and 501 Commons, um, towards compliance, there are end steps which allow you to incorporate many of these tables into a GRC solution, and and so you can automate specific activities like um, you know getting the audit questions and figure out roles. So when new content comes in, someone in a role can be said, "Hey, there's this three new controls that apply to human resources. Check these out and make sure that we're doing them." So when we get an authority document, we pull out each mandate into a separate citation record, and then each of those gets mapped to a single control. So the issuer could be NIST or ISO or anybody, so it's one to many authority documents. Each document has multiple citations or controls, and then each citation gets connected to a single common control. So we have hundreds of thousands of citations, but only about 10,000 controls. So there's a huge overlap in what all these requirements are asking. And by the way, authority documents is our umbrella term for laws and rules and standards and you know anything that we're mapping into the UCF. Okay, so what about um, how we get data in? And we get data in through something we call UCF Mapper. UCF Mapper is the, the methodology for, for putting content into the UCF and we've patented quite a bit of stuff around it. And I'm not gonna go deeply into this, but there is a training program administered through IC Squared. Right now it's in pre-release and um, this month that will finish, and next month it'll be available through IC Squared's um, site, et cetera. And whatever gets mapped through the UCF mapper will be available through the Common Controls Hub and the API, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have questions about this, we can, we can talk later offline, but this is more kind of the next step, right, if you wanna add your own content. So what I wanted to show is a quick demonstration of pulling out a citation, tagging the citation, and then matching that to controls because that will help you understand really you know, how we got from you know, here to what I'm gonna be showing you in the Common Controls Hub. So let's look at the demonstration from NIST 800-171. So if you're providing services for the government, chances are they're gonna ask you to do 800-171. And this is citation 3.1.2, says limit information system access to the types of transactions and functions that authorized users are permitted to execute. And you read this and you say, okay, what does this mean to me? And from the common control perspective, we map that to establish access rights based on least privilege. 
right? Because you can see the primary verb, the primary nouns, right? And then authorized users, so that's least privilege. So we got it, okay, that's what that means, no problem. Well, if we keep reading down the same document, just a couple references later, 315 says, employ the principle of least privilege. So you will find in a lot of cases that the authorities use different words to mean the same thing, in, even within the same document. So we're able to show you and end some of the confusion about what does this stuff really mean by having a common control. It really simplifies this process. And you can imagine if we're doing this in within a document, obviously we're doing it between documents. So these common controls become like a Rosetta Stone to understand what the stuff really means. But because it's attached to the original mandates, you can always go look deeper to say, okay, are there other specific things that I need to look at to really make sure I'm compliant? So that's the UCF mapper part. Um, and it, there's a lot of it that's based on compliance dictionary. And just to give you a little feel for that, because this is something that you have free access to. So you can go to compliancedictionary.com right now and do a search for terms. In this case, I did personal data. Um, almost all of you have to deal with personal data, right? Whether it's employees or the, your clients that you're doing services for or whatever. And um, when you look at that term, um, you can see it's connected. And this is part of where our patents lie because we're connecting the, the phrase, you know, personal data to, you know, is there non-confidential information? That's obviously an antonym, right? And then there's PII, right? It's a synonym, personal identifiable information. And then you can see how it's connected and you can come and play with this yourself. I don't have to go through everything. But this is part of our dictionary structure that we've built in so that when we're doing this mapping, right, you can see the dictionary sits between the citations and the controls. So we are very carefully making sure that we understand specifically when it says R-E-C-O-R-D is at a large black disk where that music comes from, um, or is it a record in a database, or does that mean record something, right? Is it a noun, is it a verb, what does it mean? So that we can accurately connect it to the common controls. And when you go back to this dictionary, you can see that that phrase is connected to very specific controls. Right, personal data, personal data, personal data, um, all through. Now, when you have a noun and a verb connected, that's when you can come up with some accuracy and understanding of how you, you know, the semantic crosswalking rules, how close is the match. And this is really important, and we take care of this all within UCF Mapper. And I'm showing you this to give you a good solid feeling of the work that we're doing, right? Um, to, that we're not just having some gal or guy in a cube throwing stuff in a spreadsheet. There is a scientific process that we're following to, and a legal process to connect the citations to our common controls. So if you have turn off the lights and shut the lights, okay, well, that's a verb hop away, and that's a 92% connection, right? So we can connect those, but if you, if you have throw the ball and shut off the lights, that's so far away you can't connect them, right? The accuracy is just so far away. So it, the system won't even let them connect it. Okay, so that's how that all works. Now, the way we get the data out of the UCF is through the Common Controls Hub. And, and so there are a couple of ways to do it. One is to go directly in the Common Controls Hub and get exports into spreadsheets. And that, that's the first step, and that's, that's what we're offering today. But there's a future possibility if you wanna connect it to GRC software. And the GRC software that we work with, there's quite a few, you can look on our website, but we work with a lot of the common GRC software. Okay, so um, let's go into the Common Controls Hub. Right. So once you log into the Common Controls Hub, you can go over to the workspace. And the idea here is, this is the interface to the database, right? And, and so it's like a wizard. It sits on top of the list of authority documents, and when you check the box for one of the authority documents, what happens is it uses the citation table as a filter and then just shows the common controls associated with that authority document. It makes it really easy, right, to see if you, uh, now that you understand what we're doing. But if I had just come in and said, ah, click the document, boom, there's a list of controls. Um, like I said, voodoo magic, and we don't want to do the voodoo magic. We want to prove that we're doing this scientifically and legally um, so you understand what's going on. So um, the idea is you pick from this list like a wizard and you, you can look by geography or you can look by subject matter. So if you're dealing with a specific vertical like healthcare, you can come in and look through the documents and 
you know, search through 24 CFR or, you know, 21 or 42 or 45 CFRs, um, because you know the, the HIPAA legislation itself is not a lot there, right, um, from, from an IT perspective, but it's all the CFRs and NIST 866 and all the other stuff that comes to play. So it's really easy to come in and say, well, I want FISMA, right? And you can just type it in if you know what you want. And by selecting that document, right, that's the first one I've selected, boom, I now have a list of common controls. And it doesn't, this is, you know, a scientific process, or it's, it's programmatic. It doesn't matter what I pick here, I'm going to have the same result, which is the union of all the controls selected and displayed. And so as I go through, and I want to say that because it doesn't matter what I'm doing in the demo, you can create your own sets that are specific to your organization. So if I type in 20, right, 20 critical security controls, boom, now I've added that. And I can see the lists of authority documents here as I add them. Do I want PCI? I have about 3.2. There it is, DSS. Boom. Right? And what if I want 866? And let's pick it. Right? So now I have a list that is what I need for my organization. And you can see the documents again on the left and on the right I've got these common controls. I want to explain this just a little bit so you can understand what you're looking at. And by the way, you can come in and do just what I did here um, for free and check it out yourselves. So now you won't have access to all the documents. The, the most recently mapped documents are available for paid subscribers and the ones that are kind of older in the library are available to all for research and so on. But you can at least get the idea and get the feel. You'd be able to use like PCI 3.1 for example, not 3.2. Okay. Now, how is this organized? It's a legal hierarchy, right? These are the top levels. We call these impact zones um, uh, of all the controls that were selected from the authority documents that are on the left-hand side. And if I want to look into monitoring and measurement, I just have to click on the disclosure triangle. And now notice that some of these things are in bold and some are italics. Well, if it's in bold, it's be because it's mandated. And what does that mean? See how there's little dots? I can just hover over it and it's going to tell me because they're direct requirements. Okay. Now what about implied? Monitoring measurement is in italics. That's because it's a parent of a mandated control. And we have to keep this in the legal hierarchy or it'll just be jumbled up and make no sense. Right? So um, if I open up IT inventory, you can see it says hardware, interconnected systems, software, storage media, these are specifically required, but records inventory is not. And so these are implementation controls. These, the ones in plain text are children of mandated controls. And the reason why we put them here is sometimes the requirements are so top level and some of them will say, just maintain an IT inventory and won't even have any of these details. So you might have to say, oh, well, maybe hardware. And if I look deeper, look, network equipment and mobile devices. And so if I click get info on any of these, I can see, here's the control, and I can see specifically why it's here. So this is in the 20 security controls, and it's in PCI 3.2. Make sure you get your network equipment. So it shows you the overlaps, it shows you how to pull these things together, but when you're looking at what do I need to do, I need to have an IT inventory, it needs to have hardware and software and storage media and all the interconnected systems. I must do those things. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And by the way, as you do these things, you, you realize these th uh, the requirements, the authority documents themselves, all come in at all these different levels. And that top 20 security, that was, that's a very specific low level thing for a high level document, right? But it's still what it asked for. So once you have your list, you save it. So I'm gonna call it my 501c3, and I can do a couple of things here. I can share it, and I can publish it. So by sharing it, that allows GRC software, connects through the API, anything that connects to the API, any, any software out there, will then be able to see this list. And if I publish this list, I can actually share it out. And so, um, like, to anybody with just a link, and I'll show you how that works. And we call it a portable compliance profile. So there's this portable compliance profile well, it's specific to this list. So my 501c3, I can see 
these controls and these documents on this portable co compliance profile. So any organization can say, here's what we're following and here's what we're doing, and put a link on their website if they want, if they want to have complete transparency. And actually, I'll just open this in a new window. Notice it says my 501c3. Here are the documents, and then here are all the controls and everything in there. So anybody can come in and do research. Um, you can say, hey, this is the stuff you need to do, um, and then they can choose to add it to their own um, common controls hub if they want. Okay, great. So once I have a, a list, I can create a build, compare, distribute, or track. So I'm only going to talk about a couple of these because we don't have a tremendous amount and that's what you're going to be doing, um, or that's what the Graham's organization is going to be doing for you. So I call that my, I can, if I can be three for me, based on the document here, I'll get through the output um, from the system. And while that's going, I'm going to do a quick compare. So one of the other, I'm doing the stuff here, and then someone says, I have to do something else. How can I easily understand what that is? Well, you can in the Common Controls Hub, right away. Like, let's go down and look at my 501c3. I'll select that. And that's going to bring that same list that I had before. That's my 685 controls. And then it's like, okay, well, what do you want to compare it to? And what haven't I put in here? I haven't put in, I don't think I put in the original HIPAA. So let's just put in, okay, let's put in 45 CFR part 170. There we go. Hey, look, I'm already doing 13, and there are five other ones that I would have to do. So this, that's where I, you know, the Venn diagrams that we saw earlier, this is how I did it, right? So the union is 690, 672 are already being done, five are not being done, and 13 are. So I can look at the 13 and say, <laughs> look how little, assign user permissions based on job responsibilities. Okay, that's, that's the common control, that makes sense. So from list A, it's from PCI, and from list B, here it is. And I can do that to see also what I'm not doing. All right, well, it's technical. Manage the use of encryption controls and implement non-repudiation for transactions. Okay, I don't know what that means. But here we are. I'm not an analyst, I just play one on TV. Okay, so um, let's see if the build is completed. And this, you know, usually it's about the time it takes to get a cup of coffee. Ah, it's still going. It's because it's a live webinar, right? That's why it's still going. Um, but I'm going to just pick a different list. I've got one here called Craigslist and download it. And it's going to show me, um, in fact, while it's doing that, why don't I go over here and show you what's on Craigslist. And then I'm done. And then Graham's going to take over. Here we go, Craigslist. So based on this authority document list, right, with these documents, I get this output. And this is what Graham is offering you, um, the controls. And there's a spreadsheet here called UCF controls. And it'll have all of the controls that are here on the right-hand side in order, in hierarchy, it came up on my other screen, so let me bring it over. There we go. And it will be customized based on what you need. So it's not going to be 10,000 controls, and it's not going to be five. It's going to be what do you need? Where do you put your priorities? And you can see it comes out like this. And what's nice about this is you can say, well, I have to do PCI 3.1. I must do it. Oh, OK. What? Uh, let's say ISO 27001. Let's pick based on that. Flex. Here we go. And so I can see where the other things overlap quite well. So that's the spreadsheet. Okay. Graham, and if you have questions, please put them in the system, and we'd be happy to answer them. Um, but Graham, take it away. Unmute. Yeah, that always, I, that's the hardest part, right? Yeah. <laughs> the technology. Unmute. Yeah, I know, it's a, even I. <laughs> so let's see, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about how 
now about our assessment process and the way when we're doing, start from the beginning, um, doing assessments, thinking about um, how a tool like Craig, like the UCF and the Common Controls Hub can work in. So the first step might be is, you know, picking the standards that we want to comply with, you know, understanding, um, and this could come at different stages, but it helps to think about and start um, thinking about where, what is the standard that we're applying with, what compliance documents, and using the Common Control Hub to explore those. Um, that might be speaking with lawyers or other constituents that are knowledgeable in this area, board members, et cetera, to help you understand, you know, what, 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 what is the path forward. Um, now, one thing that you're going to see a lot in these documents is inventorying systems and for inventorying data. We think that, you know, as part of any assessment process, this is pretty critical. You need to know what you have so that when you're going through and you're talking about how any actions you need to take, it, that's useless if you don't know it. So part of the process is inventorying all of your systems where data is stored or transmitted. Um, next is inventorying and categorizing the data that you are storing and transmitting. Um, so this is one of the systems we like to use is categorizing information by high business impact, medium business impact, and low business impact. Um, we also call these HBI, MBI, and LBI. Um, the way I think about these standards in sort of practical terms is HBI information is organization threatening information. So if that if this data got released into the wild in a way that was you know public. Um, it could potentially threaten the um, existence of our organization, or it could at least significantly impede us um, from a financial standpoint um, and reputational standpoint. Um, medium business impact is sort of costly and disrupt disruptive. Um, it might you you know, and we want to, and you really want to avoid it, but it's not going to put you out of business as an organization. Um, and then there's LBI. The things that might be embarrassing, wasteful, or annoying. So, for example, someone defaces your website um, in, you know, posting something embarrassing up there. That might be an LBI type of thing. It's, um, and then, so now once we sort of understand what we have, we also want to define our th the threats versus our acceptable risk. You're not going to be able to do everything. The standards walk you through often what you need to think about implementing different controls, but there's also investments you're going to take in actions you're going to take after the fact. And you can't be perfect. We can't, no organization, frankly, can be perfect on this front. So we need to define um, what is acceptable versus unacceptable. And um, by, based upon the threats we faced and the risk we're willing to take. And then we can make good decisions about what to do. The next step is evaluating. So using um, the Common Controls Hub and the controls that we talk about is a great part of that to go through, look at what we're, um, walk through the controls, where they apply to systems and data and inventory, um, define, um, evaluate the level and our ability to implement the control for those different systems, and then create action plans. And, you know, the way I think about it is, is that by inventorying the system and categorizing things, we're able to often scope down what we have to do. For, you know, a perfect example of this is, you know, by knowing where, say, personal data is or P, um, a PII, uh, personal identifiable information for clients are, if we can... Um, scope down the systems and only pay attention to specific systems in terms of, say, advanced security, that is a great thing. And that helps us um, limit the work that we have to create in our action plan. And then finally, we need to repeat this process so that when we come back and, you know, we have to do this on an annual or semi-annual basis because this is an, you know, ongoing process. As I said, the standards change the state of the art in terms of security and best practices change, and also our organizations change. Where we're storing information, what we're doing, that changes over time. Now, ideally, as part of you know implementation, your controls have been in place in order so that when you make changes, 
you're considering all of the, these compliance information along the way. And thus, that repeat process is perfunctory. It's about saying, great, we did all these things, we're good to go. And, you know, it's limited. But you do need to come back on a regular basis and look at this to make sure that you're following, you're, you're, you're complying with the standards you selected. Now, some tips. Um, wherever possible, look for ways to scope down your risk by removing um, systems where you don't need it. So this is, are we transmitting information through email? If, you know, for example, this is a very common one. And what can we do differently? How can we get it out of there so we don't have to protect email in the same way we might protect our database? And I, the advice I gave a client is this can be a process improvement opportunity. So, for example, that um, database that, that you've been really saying we need a client management database or client records database or, um, you know, um, system, we, this, by going through this process, we can make a better case, a stronger case for why we not only should do this or want to do this, but we have to do this. So think about it as an opportunity to not just comply, but improve your processes. Also, you know, be realistic about your capabilities to protect on-premise systems. You know, there are significant advantages in cloud systems, be they, you know, Google Apps, Office 365, Dropbox, Box.com, all of these systems, you know, you can leverage the advantages they these organizations bring in terms of um, economies of scale and reputation of risk to that vendor. If Office 365 has a breach, that is significantly more um, impactful to Microsoft than it is to say if your Exchange server on your um, at your organization is breached. That is something that they get in the news, they lose money, and they have therefore, and, and they lose clients because they want to protect not just small nonprofits information, but they have large Fortune 500 companies storing data in those systems. So you can leverage that investment, leverage those economies of scale to protect your systems. And so be skeptical of, you know, just the fact that you have a box sitting in your office doesn't mean it's safe, even though you can unplug it. Because most likely, you may not know when it's breached or when someone's in there. Um, be thorough in your inventory of data. Think about data at rest and in transit, meaning I'm storing information and I'm also having being sent it, sending it. Often, you know, this is e email is evil because so much gets sent through email. And we think about that as being, you know, well, I store these, you know, donor files on the server. Well, how did they get there? Well, someone, you know, pulls a report from Razor's Edge and then emails it to me and then I copy it to the, this file server share. Well, now because that's sent through email, it's not only is that email stored, you know, it's been sent through maybe across the internet. It might be um, transmitted and stored into an, uh, a phone or other mobile device and it spreads all over the place. So be thorough in thinking not just about where you store things for permanent storage, but like how is it getting there? What's the process? Um, be skeptical of restrictions and rules. Shadow IT, I see everywhere. So sometimes when you say, well, you know, no, we have a policy. Everybody needs to work from the office. We don't work from home. You know, we like to, we only have desktops, you know, we all work from the office. Well, I guarantee you, um, you have probably have staff that are getting around this because they've got a sick kid, because they have to meet a deadline and can't be in the office. So they're, you know, files are, someone's working around that, be they copying files to USB thumb drives or sending those files to their to home, you know, over email or storing them in their Google Drive. So be on the lookout for, you know, shadow IT and understand that often some restrictions and policies are very frequently worked around. Um, also, BAAs, these are business associates agreement, only go so far. So if you've signed up, if you're doing HIPAA stuff or, you know, other um, covered work, you may have a um, contract in place with uh, like Microsoft or Dropbox to sort of cover that information. But that only defines the responsibilities of the provider and their responsibilities to report breaches and other things to you. You need to pay attention to how it's configured. Make sure your systems are configured appropriately to the requirements. And because often, and so and in many cases, the providers will give you 
we can give guidance about how best to configure their systems to support certain standards. But the contract and that stuff is only legalese. It doesn't actually do, you know, a whole lot. Um, okay, lastly, just because we're nonprofits, there's a lot of free stuff out there or low cost things to help you as you go through these systems. Um, if you're not, you know, you need antivirus or other things or, um, you know, go to TechSoup and look at the software there because they often have, you know, business oriented software. Like if you don't, if you have antivirus, you're a very small organization, you know, go there and get managed software designed for business at a discount. Um, Microsoft, we really like um, some of the things that they're doing. Um, their Azure grant in particular is very generous of so $5,000 per year of Azure services. And even if you're not having, you don't want cloud services or cloud servers, if you've got an on-premise server, they have multi-factor authentication that you can implement. Um, and it's it'll there the grant will cover the fees and this gives you that ability to require not just a password but a phone call or some kind of authorization to say connect to an on-premise server so Azure MFA is a great deal and it can be free under the grant also office 65 has their um, enterprise mobility suite that um, can do the like provide Intune, um, advanced threat protection, and other types of security functions and features to protect mobile data. Um, lastly, you know, logs come up in this process. Um, Splunk is a system that aggregates logs, um, and they have Splunk for good. So at certain sizes of organizations, it can be their software can be free, and I believe they'll offer discounts for larger organizations. So that's generally. Um, you know, where we <clears throat> are with, uh, with the software. Um, resources, so there's the Common Controls Hub. As Craig said, you can log in and create a free account to explore, um, uh, some, explore the controls, um, you know, play with it, understand you know, what's going on, and even build, um, or not, well, not build, but construct lists of your own so that you can, un um, understand compliance. Now, as Craig alluded to, um, you can come to 5.1 Commons and talk to us about this. Um, we're doing security assessments for nonprofits. Also, if you just want to get, um, you know, help us develop, work with you to build, a, get a build and get access to the latest documents, we have some, um, we work with Craig and his team to get some um, advantageous pricing for nonprofits. Um, and we're really grateful for that contribution from Com um, Unified Compliance. And so you can work with us to uh, define a document and get a build and we can, you know, get that to you. Um, if you're curious about some of these, the background, you know, look at SANS and their, you know, what they talk about about the credit controls. So you might be going to websites for these um, standards bodies to understand, you know, what is the document, why should you implement it, and what do you get out of, say, that standard. Um, okay, so that's what I have there. Um, let's move on to Q and A. Um, let's see. So the, one of the questions I have is: Is there an independent source where we can check for a vendor's compliance? Um, usually, at least in my experience, that needs to con come from the vendor, and they can provide, say, like SOC one, SOC two compliance. Craig, do you have any, uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, it's, I, I can. There, there's no like independent away from the vendors themselves. A lot of them want to keep their compliance efforts kind of close. Um, if you look at Microsoft, for example, for Azure, you can actually go to microsoft.commoncontrolshub.com. So they're leveraging our platform to display their compliance. And it's actually pretty cool. You go in, you can get a free account. and They've created a list that shows up for anybody who registers through Microsoft.commoncontrolshub.com, and it's like it's their Azure compliance list, and you pick it, and boom, you can see everything they're attesting to. So um, that's pretty cool, and we're working with a bunch of other vendors so they can do the same kinds of things because demonstrating compliance is not easy, um, <laughs> and you, you know these guys are are constantly being audited to add more and more of these you know checkboxes 
to what they, they can say they're compliant, compliant with, but there are literally hundreds of standards out there and thousands of laws that they have to comply with. Oh, and I want to add that they're also ever-changing what the vendors are covering. Microsoft started out where their BAA and their compliant, you know, they really only covered um, Exchange Online and SharePoint and uh, Dynamic CRM. And they've expanded that coverage significantly. So now you can say use Power BI and I think Azure services for that. Um, but you really have to look at their stuff because they know what they're committing to in terms of, you know, their guarantee to you. Um, yeah. yeah. And we're working with literally three other cloud service, you know, platforms. Um, so they can do the same thing Microsoft's doing. Yeah. So this is... <laughs> It's, it's a huge problem. Um, and the other problem, of course, is they've got thousands or tens of thousands of customers all asking similar yet different questions um, and asking them to fill out these crazy spreadsheets. And so that's one of the things that's actually built into the Common Controls Hub is from a third-party attestation perspective, you can create your list and you can send your list to them and say, here, this is what I need you to comply with. Otherwise, I can't work with you. So you need to attest to this. And then within the common controls, of, if you want and they want, they can pro provide attestation. Okay. Um, let's see. How about, so is there any limit to the number of frameworks I can include? Do I have to pay separately for each one? Uh, yeah, we get asked that a lot. So um, there is a limit. It's, it's 100. So if you have to do 100, more than 100, which some of our customers have to do, then you have to do multiple lists. But, but you know, we're, um, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, 501 Commons wants to, to create something that's more than 100 authority documents anyway, because that's just way too broad. And if that's your issue, then um, we should talk directly. But in general, no, there's, there's no true actual limit. Folks, um, the, I think the average number of authority documents people have are like 10 or 12 on their um, authority document lists. So you should be fine. And it doesn't matter which one's there. It's, it's that whole scientific thing, right, where you just check the box and you get the controls. OK, great. And let's see. So, so Graham, what yeah. you're offering is to work with any of these folks, right, if they're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. to go through, help them do an analysis, figure out which authority documents they need, check the boxes, save the list, and create a spreadsheet for them. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. It can be as simple as that, exactly. And and so, what I know from what uh, my discussions with you, um, <laughs> if if they work with you, it's going to be way more advantageous from a financial perspective than if they try to come to us directly, just because we've worked with you as a non well, it's it's a nonprofit thing. So, uh, yeah. so, folks on the call, if you're interested, you should really talk to them. Great, and so it's, uh, let's see, it's 9.30. I think we said we'd try to keep this an hour. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, you you, you can try out the tool at that website, um, commoncontrolshub.com. If you are interested in getting builds, please go to uh, 501commons.org and fill out our request for assistance form, and then we can follow up and um, help you get access to the sort of full tool um and if you and or answer any other questions that you may have so yep. and if you have in, uh, questions specific to us info at unifiedcompliance.com and uh, they'll direct it to the right place great uh, thank you everyone um i appreciate everyone sticking around and have a good day thanks very much